All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you all have your lunch and are um, excited for our sessions today. Um, I just wanted to welcome you all to the third um, week of breakout sessions for the virtual Iowa Governor's Conference on Public Health. Uh, my name is Rachel Schramm. Um, I work at the Iowa Cancer Consortium in Iowa City, um, and I'm a board member of the Iowa Public Health Association and will be co-chairing um, the planning committee for the Governor's Conference next year. So I'm really happy to um, help moderate the session um, and bring you all up to speed. So as you know, we usually like to meet in person to share best practices and lessons learned. Um, and just because of coronavirus, we do miss seeing everyone in person, but we're really grateful um, for the opportunity to really share this important work um, with you all to a broader audience. And um, we've been having about 100 people um, each day attending sessions, which we think is a great win. Um, the Governor's Conference is put on every year by the Iowa Public Health Association and the Environmental Public Health Association. And I would encourage you to join your public health colleagues um, as a member of either organization. Um, our mission is really to unite and strengthen the voice of public health in Iowa, which is exactly what we're doing today um, and every day in our communities. I also wanted to just take a moment um, to thank the sponsors and exhibitors of our virtual conference their commitment to public health um, in Iowa is paramount, especially in these times. The sponsors of our virtual conference are Aetna, Amerigroup, Unity Point Health, and the University of Iowa College of Public Health. Um, if you're interested, you'll find a list of virtual exhibitors on our Governor's Conference website at iowapha.org. Um, before we go ahead and get into the um, presentations, just a reminder that everyone is on mute. Um, and to hopefully forego any Zoom bombers, um, the chat function is set to allow you to only communicate with me. So just at the end of each presentation, we'll have a little bit of time for questions. So feel free to use the chat or Q&A button um, at the bottom of your screen to ask a question and I'll go ahead and read them to the presenters. So um, some of our presentations today are pre-approved for CEU credits. Um, so I can provide more information about that as well. Um, but with that, I think I'd just like to turn it over to Deborah Thompson for our first presentation. Deborah, welcome. Thanks. Hi. Let me do my share screen. From the beginning. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Rachel. I know many of you from my tenure at IDPH when I was their legislative liaison for seven and a half years. There I had the privilege of meeting public healthers from all around the state who have dedicated their lives to improving and protecting the health of Iowans. So I was inspired regularly then and I felt humbled to represent public health professionals at the State House. Since March of this year, I've watched the public health community support one another. I've watched leaders put themselves out there publicly to lead their communities in our state through crisis. And I've read posts from people who are exhausted but still feel a duty to serve. So again, I find myself inspired by you all. I need to say thank you, thank you, thank you for being who you are and for using your powers for good. Um, although with that said, I do hope you all still like me after this presentation. I'm going to start with some levity. This is one of my um, COVID coping videos. Um, I'm sharing my computer sound, so it's about three minutes long. Stay with me. Yeah, I really don't understand why everybody isn't following the same rules right now. They're very clear, so let's take a minute and let's go over them again. You must not leave the house for any reason. Unless, of course, you have a reason, and then you may leave the house. All stores are closed, except those that are open. And all stores must close unless, of course, they need to stay open. This virus is deadly, but don't be afraid of it. It can only kill people who are vulnerable and also those who are not vulnerable. We should stay locked down until the virus stops infecting people. And it will only stop infecting people if enough of us get infected that we build immunity. So it is very important that we get infected and also do not get infected. You should not go to the doctor's office or the hospital unless you have to go there. Unless, of course, you are too sick to go there. This virus has no effect on children except for those children in which it affects. The virus 
virus remains active on different surfaces for two hours or four hours or six hours, but in most cases it's days and not hours and it needs a damp environment or a cold environment that is warm and dry in the air unless the air is plastic. Schools are closed, so you need to homeschool your children unless you can send them to school because you are not home. If you are at home, you can school your children using various portals and online classrooms unless you have poor internet, more than one child, only one computer, or you are working from home. Baking cakes can be considered math, science, or art. If you are home educating, you can include household chores within their education curriculum. And if you are home educating, you may start drinking at approximately 10 a.m. every day. If you are not home educating children, you may also start drinking at approximately 10 a.m. Masks are useless at protecting you against the virus but you still need to wear one because it can save lives. And in some cases it may even be mandatory, but also maybe not. You must not go to work, but you can get another job at which point you may go to work. Stay home. I don't know how many more celebrities we need to have tell you how important it is to go outside and take care of your mental health. There is no shortage of groceries in the supermarket. There are simply many things missing. You don't need to go buy a bunch of toilet paper, but you should buy some in case you need it. If you are sick, you may go out once you are better, but those in your household, they cannot go out once you are better, unless of course they need to go out. Animals are not affected by the virus, except for that cat that tested positive in Belgium in February, plus a couple tigers. The number of corona related deaths will be announced daily, but we don't know how many people are infected because we were only testing those who are almost dead to determine if that's what they will die of. The people who die of corona who are not counted won't or will be counted, but maybe not. To help protect yourself during these times, you should be eating well and exercising, but exercising only eating what you have at home to avoid going to the stores unless you need toilet paper or a fence panel. It's important to get fresh air, but don't go to parks, but do go walk in other places. Just don't sit down unless you are old or pregnant. But if you do sit down, don't sit for too long unless you are old and you are pregnant, in which case you need to sit down. But if you do sit down, don't eat unless you've had a long walk, which you are allowed to do if you are old or pregnant, except for times in which you aren't. Don't visit old people but you have a moral obligation to take care of old people and bring them food and medicine. And finally, no businesses will go down due to coronavirus, except those businesses that go down due to COVID-19. I hope this cleared up any questions about what we should and should not be doing during this time. Please educate your friends and family with this information so we can remove any and all confusion surrounding this time. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I really, so that video makes me laugh, but when I, um, think about what the seriousness of it. Um, I think about how it was only six weeks ago that we as public health asked the public to completely change, <clears throat> excuse me, their way of life. So I'm marking March 15th as that date here in Iowa because that's the date we shut down the schools. So March is typically the time when people are getting excited about March Madness, spring break, and Easter, but not this year. Suddenly, they are living incredibly far outside of their comfort zones and in every aspect of their lives. Now, public health is experiencing a level of discomfort too. In the counties where Iowa is being hit particularly hard, um, there is undoubtedly emotional trauma occurring, and I'm highly sympathetic to this. But generally speaking, this is not outside of our wheelhouse. Public health is knowledgeable about infectious diseases, and we train for disasters. In March and April, we're typically coming out of peak flu season. We are typically getting ready for the fun summer stuff like church picnics that cause foodborne illnesses or disaster preparedness exercises or our annual PSAs to promote safe use of waterways, pools, and spas. So public health handles or prevents the negatives of the human condition on a daily basis. And so while we understand why we didn't get to fill out our brackets or fly to Florida for fun in the sun, we should not be surprised that everybody else in the population wanted to understand why they had to change. The problem is that you can't learn the art and science of public health in two months and while under duress. And what's especially true, and this is the point of the video, is that you can't just throw a bunch of data, statistics, bell curves, and metrics at people and get them to do what you want them to do immediately and willingly. That's just not their language and they don't understand our jargon. 
So as a result, we are met with skepticism. People are saying, you know, really? Uh, isn't that a bit much um, in our recommendations? Because people are comfortable with their ways. They were doing just fine before we showed up to warn them of a pending threat. Now, unfortunately, um, too many people had to see the impact for themselves by way of the body bags coming from other countries and then in our own. We are a highly intelligent and scientific workforce. However, the general public, the people we serve, are not compelled by our facts, figures, and metrics. Change is hard, it's uncomfortable, and it covers a spectrum of emotions that people are not used to dealing with. But friends, whether we like it or not, we are the ones who will need to adjust if we truly wanna save lives, improve the disparities in our communities, and create the conditions for a culture of health in Iowa. So here's where I would suggest we start. <clears throat> Let's reimagine our use of data as it relates to our messaging and switch gears to emotional arguments. Now, don't get upset. I'm not abandoning science on you, I promise. Hear me out. <clears throat> data should always guide our problem statements, but it should not guide the way we explain the problem especially to people outside of the profession. Communication should be guided by the target audience's morals, emotions, and feelings. And we can look to our own state for an example of this. There was a robust, and has been a robust debate in Iowa over the phrase shelter in place. <clears throat> now remember, our beloved Dr. Fauci, and Fauci we trust, the national face of public health leadership during COVID, praised the actions of Governor Kim Reynolds, um, the actions she had taken in Iowa um, as of April 6th. Now, this is despite the fact that she will not use the term shelter in place. Prior to that though, people, the media specifically, were not impressed with the governor's messaging that metrics would guide her decision-making regarding closures. Uh, metrics is an unfeeling word. It's own, understood only by the nerds in the nerdery in the Lucas building in Des Moines. And don't get me wrong, I love those nerds. What happened is that people became emotionally tied to the phrase shelter in place. So unless they heard it uttered from the highest position of authority in our state, they weren't gonna feel safe. Why? Because they understand the term shelter. It's tied to feelings of safety and stability early on in our education of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, for example, or when we're taught to find shelter in a storm. Shelter is safety. Feeling safe is necessary in a crisis. Human beings are not as evolved as we'd like to think. We are very much primal animals when it comes to our psychology. We're driven first and foremost by our primitive emotions, our intuition, our gut feelings, and our knee-jerk reactions. Then, strategic reasoning and logic follows. We look for and trust the information that backs our intuition. So, we are one big confirmation bias. The metaphor to remember this by is called the elephant and the rider. This massive elephant represents the power of instinct and the smaller rider is the strategic reasoning that follows. And it is hard for that tiny little rider to move that gigantic elephant. So in other words, logic and reasoning is used to defend and support moral intuitions and not to form them. It may be that the next level of the psychologically evolved humans will be the ones who can self-check against their first reactions. They will be the ones who can distinguish what they have been conditioned to believe and compare it to what might actually be better for mankind, our, our collective group. But, spoiler alert, even with this reflection, they may not agree with your own personal view. And our own personal views are typically what we use to fuel our communications with others. So, for public health, the shift is twofold move away from overbearing data and statistics in our messaging and retrain ourselves to anticipate the emotions and morals of our target audience. Then respect those emotions and morals by tailoring your messaging to them. 
You may not be compelled by these unique messages, but respect the fact that others are. So compel them by using arguments that are intended to convince them. These may not be the arguments that convinced you, but the end goal, your purpose, is to educate and persuade others to make health-inspired choices, not to convince people to think like you do. So for example, when I gave presentations in Johnson County, they were unique to the audiences in Johnson County. I used more facts and figures because that is a highly academic and liberally minded area of our state. When I gave presentations in Southwestern Iowa, they were unique to the audiences of Southwestern Iowa. Now, people in the audience were no less intelligent than those in Johnson County, but their upbringing was likely more conservative and I use messaging that reflected as such. So moral intuitions are not set in stone. Before you approach your next discussion, think about the person who you're meeting with or talking to or presenting in front of. What's their profession? Are they from the business community? Are they from the education sector? If it's a fellow public healther, what is their subject matter expertise? Are they a community health consultant or a disease prevention specialist? In other words, are they more people oriented or data oriented? And then you adjust your messaging accordingly. So in sum for this slide, recognize that public health is all about persuading people to choose healthy behaviors as, as often as they can. Um, there are certainly barriers to choices that need to be removed at times, I get that. Um, remember that people are compelled to change their behaviors when they feel compelled, and it's unlikely to be because you brought a pile of reports to a meeting. Finally, please remove any self-righteous tendencies when, de when developing messaging or before meeting with someone. So frankly and candidly, please stop thinking of people as stupid um, just because they're not compelled with the same information that you are compelled by. Personally, I feel like that's how we've divided the country, very juvenile name calling. Um, and this is a self-righteous tendency and it's rampant on both sides of the aisle. Now, the next couple slides I'm not going to go over, but I just wanted you to know what we would have done in the workshop if COVID hadn't reared its ugly head. I hate presentations that are all about the what you should do. I like to do more of how to do it, um, but alas, there's always next year. So um, this would have been our worksheet. We would have practiced, and maybe there'll be opportunity to do that again, but um, I just want you to know I didn't mean to just preach at you. I wanted to work with you. Uh, okay, now again, I believe that we are the ones who need to change to be more effective. Uh, we have to evolve our messaging and then we have to have the courage to actively communicate. So first, acknowledge and accept your role as leaders. Public health professionals all over the state and at every level of the organization are being looked to for information right now. Um, but it's not just in the public health institutions and agencies at the state and local level. Even if you've retired from the, from the profession, I know people are asking you for guidance. Even if you're a student, I know people are asking you for guidance. And because I know that y'all are all healthy helpertons, you've likely stepped up to decipher, interpret, and calm the fears of your friends, family, and communities while educating them on the recommended course of action. So COVID again shines a light. It's dispelling an important myth about leadership. It is a myth that a leader is someone with a grandiose presence, a magnetic personality that draws people in, or someone that holds titles that exude authority. Now, in COVID, the leaders are the folks who have done what they can do within their sphere of influence, large or small, to help Iowans get through. So public health, your leadership is showing. Please don't tuck it away until the next crisis. Take Deborah, the courage you've had. Yeah. I was going to say somebody had a question. So whenever you're ready, I can pop that in there. Okay. I'm going to wait till the end. Yep. Okay. So take the courage you've had during COVID and carry it forward. Do it for your current colleagues, your former colleagues, and for your kids and grandkids. If you don't have kids, do it for your own future and for your own community. Take the courage you've had during COVID, move out of your comfort zones, and start having ha hard conversations with people of influence, elected officials, 
the business community, the education sector, your own family members, and anyone with opposing views. Speak up, because right now and for the foreseeable future, we have the spotlight. Let's take advantage of it. Talk to people in ways that build trust and understanding of public health practice. Advocate and educate, and not just for your subject of choice, but for the profession itself, because we're all in this together, guys. Have patience, use emotion, listen to people, build trust and understanding. And there are resources out there to guide you. This is a movement in the profession and it's tied to Public Health 3.0, which is the future of public health. And it all starts with hard conversations. So I just showed you one resource, uh, the Moral Foundations Theory. Um, uh, it's uh, championed by Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan Haidt. Um, but I also enjoy the presentation given by Cerro Gordo County's Department of Public Health, um, Kelly Gerdes, on the De Beaumont Foundation's Phrases Project. So Phrases stands for Public Health Reaching Out, or excuse me, Reaching Across Sectors. Uh, it's on the IPHA YouTube channel for this virtual conference. So if you'd like to listen to it, I would recommend it. It's going to be a very useful uh, toolkit once it's released. Now, I'm sensitive to the challenges of those who work for the governmental public health system. I really am, because trust me, I know all too well the consequences of speaking up too loudly. But there are many ways to advocate, educate, and advance your goals for health. You may have to be a leader behind the scenes, but find the people in your community and in your organization who can speak up and ask them for help. The health of your community is the responsibility of many, and it's okay to point that out and make people a little uncomfortable if they're lacking in their contribution. And consider joining your professional organizations in public health. And this is especially true for the people who feel restricted. The Iowa Public Health Association and the Iowa Environmental Health Association are no different than other professional associations. They operate on economies of scale. By collecting membership dues, they can invest in advocacy and education educational offerings to their members and to the public. The associations gain influence by cultivating a network of people who are willing to contact their elected officials, for example. But understand, no numbers, no influence, no relationships, no trust, no members, no staff, and no bandwidth. Um, if you don't want to become a member of these associations, then consider periodically donating from time to time or asking friends and family to donate from time to time. I think you'd be surprised what people will do when you ask. Okay, so I've talked about the need for us to change the way we communicate, and I've discussed the need to take our COVID leadership to the next level to build trust. Because trust is the most invaluable capital we can build for our practice. Now, I'm gonna ask y'all to relive a moment from just six weeks ago. COVID-19 is barreling down on our state and your community, and no investment of time has been made to build relationships with people of influence, especially those who are bestowed the power to make life or death decisions for others. Imagine that you don't have the trust of your decision makers, because this is undoubtedly a public health crisis, they might reach out and you might get a chance to discuss options and epi curves and metrics, but imagine that they're clouded with the following thoughts as they try and follow along with you. Does this person really know what they're talking about? What's their political affiliation? Did they vote for me? I thought public health is all about poverty, Medicaid, and healthcare access. Can I trust this person more than I trust others who are telling me different things? And then they want me to close the economy and then you can watch their wheels turn as they calculate the political capital loss compared to the guilt when people die. Just saying. So how successful do you think public health professionals were all over the country and in our own states? Or how successful will they be when they don't have the trust of their decision makers? And people's lives depended on it in this crisis and still do. Now imagine that you're Garrett Claybaugh. Garrett is the director of the Department of Public Health in Iowa. He knows Governor Reynolds because he was appointed by Governor Branstead. And as we all know, or should know, she was the lieutenant governor for that administration. So she's heard Garrett speak in cabinet meetings and uh, knows that Garrett is a knowledgeable, likable, and patient public health leader. 
He's done a great job of explaining the accomplishments of his staff on a regular basis as well. Now, Garrett and his staff have had to explain the painful details of public health epidemiology and disease surveillance, but they are starting from a place of a trusted relationship. So when I see the press conferences, I see a governor who is relying on her public health experts to guide her. Now, we're getting into a phase where other variables are in play, like the economy. The decisions are not as clear cut as leaders grapple with the reset, but still, Garrett's department staff continue to be a reliable and consistent presence. We are all benefiting from that trusted relationship right now. However, as we review the crisis, and we will, and we'll do it with the clarity of hindsight eventually, what are the other benefits that could have been realized if we had also invested in building trusted relationships within the business community, the public, the faith-based community, and other sectors before COVID hit? Now, before I move on, I wanna reaffirm an earlier point. Garrett is not in front of the camera right now. He's leading from behind the scenes. He's got his deputy director out there and then our lovely Fauci equivalent, Dr. Caitlin Padati. She's Iowa State epidemiologist and medical director. I personally find Dr. Padati soothing and I'm pleased with her abilities. I'm happy to have her here in Iowa considering she's only been here a few years. Um, and on that note, I'm going to cut away for a quick plug on a fundraiser I'm conducting. So be ready to do a print screen really quick. Um, this is a personal fundraiser. It's not tied to IDPH or IPH Day, but it's celebrating an important public health leader here in our state, Dr. Padati. The donations above the cost for shipping and the shirt will be donated to the Iowa Public Health Association because I believe in their mission to unite and amplify the voice for all public health practice in Iowa. So take a screenshot, hit me up if you're interested. I'm picking up the second order today. In fact, these are exclusive shirts and they cannot be found uh, at any ray gun stores or online. Okay, thank you for indulging me. All right, so we're gonna bring it home by connecting all of the dots. Public health is prevention, prevention, prevention. Preventing illness and injury is successful only when you can persuade people to behave in ways that promote health and well-being. To persuade people, you must have patience for their understanding, respect for, your, for their experiences and morals, and then you must be likable. The reward for your patience, understanding, and charm is trust. Trust is a powerful capital for influence. Influence tears down barriers and promotes efficiency, especially in crisis. You don't have to start from the beginning when they already trust you. And I'm not using hyperbole, I'm really not when I say this. Public health professionals with influence will bring world peace. I'm, I'm so serious about that. It may not be in my lifetime, um, but in the future when all is well, it will be because public health professionals will be in influential leadership positions. You heard it here first. I'll put it on my epitaph. For now, I'll settle for starting with the goal to develop a culture of health in Iowa that puts the health of all Iowans first in order for us all to enjoy prosperity and happiness. Now, I do need to point out that nowhere on the slide is the word easy. Nowhere in this presentation did I say the word easy until now, but we're public health and we can do hard things. So um, on the next slide, there's not time to play this video. Um, but it's really good for people like me who like really inspirational stuff. In fact, it makes me cry every time I listen to it. Um, I'm really feeling this kid right here in the front row. Oh man, love it. Um, so, you know, circle back around to these slides, they'll be posted. Um, but this video reminds me of my love for public health and for the nonprofit sector. My friends, my colleagues, you did not just accept a job. You've made a lifestyle commitment that's greater than yourself. And so I will absolutely fight for you. That's what this song is about. I just hope I've compelled you to be alongside me and perhaps others involved in IPHA and EPHA as well. So with that, I will take your questions now. Oh, it wants to play. Oh, it's so good, you guys. Okay. 
Thanks, Deborah, for that great presentation. I was going to say we have um, one question in the chat. So just a reminder for anybody that you can put your questions there and I'll ask them to Deborah. But the first comes from Dee Murphy. She said, can you please give an example of the same message that you would give to two different areas of the state? What might you say to each group of people? Okay, that's a great question. Um, I'll go back to my, um, I'll give it like a urban versus rural dynamic maybe, or maybe Johnson County versus, um, uh, Oh, I know. I, I did uh, a lot of opioid related presentations um, in the last few months. I was with the department and I did one in Polk County and I and then I did one down in Davis County. And the one in Polk County, I um, I think I, I brought more of the uh, story as told by graphs. Um, so I um, used those visuals um, to show the increase in opioid deaths over the past few years. Um, I still brought with me my um, emotionally driven pictures. I just spent a little bit more time um, explaining the story that the, that, the, um, that the graphs were telling. So um, I use data, but I don't let them, I don't just I didn't just put it out there for them to, you know, okay, so make your own conclusions. I said, this is what the graph is telling us. And here is the real life faces that are involved. Um, and then in Davis County, I started with that spiel. So um, I told the story of my, my husband, Joe, but I presented it in a way that they could identify with just at the community level. This was a, a small town hero and he looks a lot like you do and he worshiped a lot like you do um and um you know if it can happen to him it can happen to um you know the the folks in your community as well does that answer your question i was gonna say i'll wait for a response but i think that 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 was good okay um the other question is an anonymous question. If you're using different messages across the aisle, um, for example, how do you make sure that you're not accused of being a hypocrite? Well, tell me a problem that only has one solution um, or one way to go about it. I mean, commonly, what I found at the legislature is that if you if you spoke first to, to morals, um, everyone, everyone deserves to be um, uh, happy. You know, everyone, um, uh, yeah, I mean, just starting from that. Now, how we achieve happiness is really where the arguments are at. The best pieces of legislation that were crafted in my time were the ones where you took the different approaches that were, and then you reminded both sides of the aisle, what the what the common purpose was, and you could figure out ways to um, uh, have them compromise on their approaches. So um, you, you may not have um, a a very clear um, absolute. Well, let me back that up. Anybody who speaks in absolutes were always the people I was most fearful of. Um, if you're trying to achieve the goal and you only see one way to achieve it, you yourself are likely part of the problem. And it's not hypocritical to think, okay, this person has had their own set of experiences in this life. This life is hard. I can appreciate that um, we did not grow up the same way, that we were not educated in the same um, schools, and that we did not worship in the same, um, in the same way. Uh, but I can respect the fact that that doesn't mean that's a bad person that I'm trying to convince or talk to. And so actually hearing what they have to say, you might find more commonality, you will likely find more commonality um, than, uh, and it might pleasantly surprise you. And so you're always at your best when you can start um, from a place of general understanding and respect. I mean, without a, a specific example, it's hard for me to kind of think of where this person is, is coming from in their question, but um, hopefully that makes, makes some sense. Rachel, did that make sense or did I just ramble on? 
I may have just rambled. No, no, I, I thought it made sense. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I trust you to tell me when I'm just like rambling. No, that's great. That I think is the last question for now. So maybe we'll, if anybody else has any questions for Deborah, you'll be around at the end too. Yeah. And you know, anybody should feel free to reach out to me at my email address. Um, let me know how I can help. Um, and you know, just be looking for what we're doing at IPHA on the advocacy committee. I'm the co-chair with Brandon Rorig from Dickinson County now, and, and I think we're going to do good things. Awesome. Thank you so much, Deborah, for your presentation. Thanks, Rachel. Yep. All right, next up we have Ms. Elise who will continue um, to talk about the topic of public health communication and share some of the specifics of a health communication campaign. So Elise, are you there? Yes, I am here. <laughs> All right, let me get my slides pulled up here. Yep. All right. Okay, so we should be able to see them. Yep, we got it. Awesome, alrighty. So, um, as they said, my name is Elise Beckler. I just want to say thanks for taking the time to attend this presentation on developing a health communication campaign. Um, I am a second year Master's of Public Health student studying community and behavior health at the University of Iowa. College of Public Health. Um, under the direction of Dr. Shelley Campo and our public health course, Health Communication Campaigns, we developed a campaign which I'm here to talk about today. My fellow classmates were also members of this project, including Ole Inka, who is a University of Iowa College of Dentistry student, as well as Eliza and Abby, who are also second year Masters of Public Health students within my department. Our community partner for the project was Johnson County Public Health Department, as this um, health communication campaign will be implemented through them, and our contact at Johnson County was Sam Jarvis. So, a little bit of background about our issue. We are likely all aware that climate change is a growing issue that's widespread and affects the globe in a variety of different ways, such as natural disasters, um, a decrease in air and water quality, and our topic, which is about fluctuation of temperatures. So here in the Midwest, we are more likely to see negative health effects resulting from climate change. Our project chose to focus on extreme heat, which is occurring during the summer months. And now it's not only occurring more intensely, but also for longer periods of time. During our extensive literature review, we found a variety of populations that are more vulnerable to these health effects from extreme heat, which includes those who may be housing insecure, are primarily working outside, are of low socioeconomic status, and may also be older adults. After consulting with our community partner, Johnson County Public Health, we were encouraged to focus on the older adult population in hopes that our health communication campaign would become a component of a larger campaign to address other vulnerable populations in the future. Older adults are more at risk for heat-related morbidity, mortality, and complications as extreme heat can exacerbate pre-existing conditions and also they are more likely to be taking medications, making them more at risk. However, even without having pre-existing health conditions or taking these medications, older adults are simply more at risk because as we age, our physiological function changes. Even though older adults are very susceptible to negative health outcomes, they may not feel that they're at risk or understand the severity that extreme heat poses. Because of this, it's essential that public health professionals and organizations are creating effective campaigns to communicate how extreme heat poses a risk. So this is our main objective of the campaign, which was to reduce 
heat-related morbidity and mortality that we see among older adults living in Johnson County. We also had other goals that were included in our evaluation plan, which included the number of adults interacting with our campaign materials, as well as the number of community partners and organizations that posted or utilized our materials. Um, I'd also like to mention the center. It's a senior center that's located in downtown Iowa City. They proved to be very helpful as we coordinated with Latasha Deloach, who offered space for us to not only conduct our survey and pilot test, but she also suggested partners whom Johnson County Public Health and ourselves could share the campaign materials with. We identified specific towns within Johnson County as target locations, which included Iowa City, Oxford, Solon, and Lone Tree. These were all selected as their geographic spread throughout the county and also because they have nonprofit agencies or city organizations that they already possess that would be willing to collaborate. We also created a list of these agencies and organizations for Johnson County Public Health Department to use and depend on as partners to share the materials in the future. We wanted to develop a theory-informed campaign, and these were the two models that we selected, and both of these are behavior-motivated. So the key constructs from the health belief model include perceived susceptibility and severity, which combine to create perceived threat. They also uh, include perceived benefits as well as barriers, and finally, self-efficacy and the cue to action component. For the extended parallel process model, the key constructs include threat appraisals, which again focuses on susceptibility and severity, as well as efficacy appraisals, focusing on self-efficacy and response efficacy. We utilize the constructs from both theories throughout our campaign process, including during our survey, material development, revisements, and for future considerations you'll be able to see the theories kind of integrated throughout the process. The first big step of our campaign was the creation and administration of our survey. We created 15, we recruited 15 participants who were 65 years or older, which is what our definition of being an older adult was. And we recruited them at the center, which I mentioned. Um, the survey asked a variety of questions that were created to assess our target population. We were looking at their perceived risk and susceptibility to extreme heat, as well as preferred methods to receiving information so we could develop materials that were not only um, effective, but also were applicable to them in the ways that they would want to receive them. We then used the campaign, uh, excuse me, then we then used the survey results to create campaign materials to communicate with older adults about extreme heat. Again, we used the health belief model as well as the extended parallel process model to shape our materials. Um, after developing the materials, we then pilot tested them again at the center with up 10 older adults to get their feedback and constructive criticism to make edits for uh, submission to Johnson County Public Health Department to use. So these are our survey results. Respondents were 72 years old on average and 60% were female. The initial survey that was conducted gathered our participants preferred social media, the newspaper, and listening to the radio as their top three uh, preferred modes of communication. 40% of participants reported that they were not worried about the effects of extreme heat, suggesting low perceived risk. Additionally, only 40% believed extreme heat poses a danger and can cause them harm personally. This suggests not only low perceived severity, but also low perceived susceptibility. After discussing the results from our survey, we determined our campaign materials needed to target older adults' perception of extreme heat, as they appear to not only not believe they are susceptible, 
but also that it's not a serious risk for their health. We then developed our health communication materials to focus on creating graphics to share on social media, as well as flyers, headers, and graphics to be utilized in the newspaper. Keeping our two behavioral theories in mind, we focused on targeting older adults' perceived risk, susceptibility, and severity, as well as their self-efficacy. And as I mentioned, we then tested these materials with a pilot test at the same senior center that the survey was conducted at. So these are two examples of our many communication materials that we put together. Um, these are the ones that we actually uh, revised. So these will include some of the revisions that I'll talk about in our next slide. I have indicated with arrows what part of the graphics targeted the constructs from our behavioral theories. So first we have the perceived severity. So this is where we're talking about that it's not just hot, it's dangerous. Then we talk about the perceived risk, which is where um, extreme heat can really, can, uh, can, can lead to related heat illnesses and death if precautions aren't taken. Then we also target their perceived susceptibility by sp explicitly stating that it is dangerous, especially for older adults. And finally, we target their self-efficacy by giving them options that how they can stay, stay safe during extreme heat events, which include drinking water, wearing lightweight clothing, and limiting activities. Additionally, these graphics can serve as acute action, as older adults may need if they haven't been thinking about extreme heat before. So here are our pilot test results. Um, during the pilot test, we received both positive reactions as well as suggested improvements. The older adults seemed to really like our color scheme and found it to be very eye-catching. They also seemed to favor the flyers and graphics that depicted the small sun. The older adults suggested we replace the phrase of drink plenty of water with an actual amount of recommended water intake. Another suggestion was to increase the color contrast between the text and the background, as well as the font size to make it more reader friendly. As they also provided us with locations within the newspaper for our materials to be implemented, like the front page, as well as the commercial ad sections. During our material revisement, we made sure to keep our color scheme, but we increased the contrast between colors so the font was more easily readable. We also increased the font size for that purpose as well. Since the small suns were a bit of a hit, we made sure to include those across our campaign materials. The graphics that said to drink plenty of water, we made sure to replace with drink at least eight, uh, six glasses of water a day. And finally, we included the location recommendations we received for the newspaper materials as a part of our final report for Johnson County Public Health Department to consider upon implementation. After we revised our materials and presented our final report um, to Johnson County, they will be utilized in the future. There's been a bump in the road, as we all know, called COVID-19. So right now, the concern for extreme heat is on the back burner. However, once the campaign's communication materials are implemented, the evaluation would look at how much the materials are being shared within the community, as well as the online. The number of older adults who the materials have reached would also be included in the evaluation. And finally, which is our ultimate objective, is to see a decrease in number of heat-related morbidity and mortality rates among adults here in Johnson County. So some of our limitations or would, things we need to take into consideration would be the time constraint that we faced. As between four people, we had less than a semester to create an entire campaign, including formative research, um, material development, pilot testing, and then hopefully implementation in the future. Also, while we were conducting our research, we seemed to notice how older adults were confused while we were talking about extreme heat during the late fall. 
So the time of year might have affected how many older adults were willing to discuss or participate in our survey and pilot test. Additionally, our formative research and piloting was done in Iowa City, which although it's a large portion of our population um, in Johnson County, it doesn't represent all of the county. And finally, for some conclusions, uh, older adults obviously are using multiple communication channels, so we need to make sure that we're offering multiple channels back to them to be able to receive information. By engaging participants in our development process, we were able to significantly improve our materials as well and things like such as readability. So it is important to include them in part of the process. Also, the inclusion of behavior motivated theories beneficial, as we know that these theories have been used to create effective campaigns in the past. And finally, Johnson County Public Health should consider developing a larger comprehensive community toolkit for extreme heat response, as older adults are not the only population that is vulnerable to extreme heat here in the Midwest. And that is it. Thank you so much for coming to my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to answering any questions. Awesome, thanks Elise. Um, just a reminder, if anybody has any questions, put them in the chat. Um, right now I'm not seeing any Elise, so okay. maybe we'll just save some for the end if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Awesome, thanks so much. All right, so finally we have Josie um, and Sophie who are going to give us an overview of the Healthy Life Stars program. Awesome, thank you guys. You're welcome, I'll share my screen. Sophie, can you see that? <laughs> Okay, perfect. So hi everyone, I am Josie Henson and I'm the program coordinator for Healthy Life Stars. With me today I have Sophie Dollison who is our assistant program coordinator and she is an undergraduate at the College of Public Health or at the University of Iowa um, studying public health. So our presentation today is about our program Healthy Life Stars and our presentation is titled Empowering Children One Lesson at a Time by Turning Unhealthy Habits into healthy lifestyles through collaboration in a neighborhood near you. So today we're gonna overview our Healthy Life Stars program. We're gonna talk about um, the program when we first received it in 2018, as well as the evaluation that we conducted in 2019, and then what we have done with the program since that. Um, we'll talk about how to implement the program in the community, as well as we would have liked to do an example lesson if we were all meeting in person. However, we'll kind of briefly go over what an example lesson looks like as well as next steps. So our objectives for our presentation today are to increase your awareness of the Healthy Life Stars program and how it aims to educate children on healthy lifestyle habits, as well as understand how to improve obesity prevention efforts throughout the state of Iowa through the implementation of this program and to analyze the results and recommendations of the, of, of the evaluation in order to understand the next steps for future childhood obesity prevention programming. So first, I'll start off by giving you guys a little overview of Healthy Lifestyles. Um, but to start that off, we need to know the statistics. So um, Iowa has the seventh highest adult obesity rate in the nation along with the 10th highest obesity rate for youth age 10 to 17. Right now, there is currently one in every three adults that are currently um, obese, and these numbers continue to grow. So our mission at, as a national nonprofit, Healthy Life Stars, is to motivate and educate kids to live active and healthy lives now and in the future. Our program works to provide an innovative and holistic set of tools that integra integrates three fundamental elements of a healthy lifestyle. Those include physical activity, nutrition, and personal goal setting. So Healthy Life Stars originated in Arizona and has spread to the following six states. And the goal of Healthy Life Stars nationally is to expand nationwide to reach all of the most vulnerable children. So like I said, Healthy Life Stars came to Iowa in the fall of 
2018 and is housed at the University of Iowa in the College of Public Health. Um, over the first pilot year of the program, we expanded into um, the Johnson, Johnson County area, um, but within the last six months, we've been able to expand to the state or to the counties that are um, shown here. And so far, we've reached almost 2,000 participants in the Iowa City and surrounding areas. Our goal for this program is to expand statewide and to eventually have a site in all 99 counties. So next so, we want to go over uh, a little bit more of the Healthy Lifestyles programming with how we received it. So again, we focus on three main uh, areas. So the goal setting is surrounded within the I Can Do It um, focus area. Physical activity is in the I Am Active focus area. And then nutrition is in the I Eat Right focus area. And then a little bit more about the, how the program works. So Healthy Lifestars in general has two models. They either have the chapter model or the university model. And the main difference between the two is where you source volunteers, either from the community or from the university student population. So in Iowa City, our model is the university model. And so we use students as volunteers to be our coaches. So once a week, about two coaches go out to each site which are in after school um, programming uh, in the Iowa City area. So that's either through the schools or different private after school programs. So two coaches go once a week to those after school programs and teach a 20 minute lesson for the first half of the hour. And then they spend about 30 minutes doing an activity that relates to that lesson um, as close as it can. Sometimes, you know, it's not a perfect relation, but the goal is to provide them with education on a healthy lifestyle, and then also be active with them. And again, this is a 12-week progression. So we take the 12 weeks because that's about a semester long of school. And so each week you build off of the lessons. And then we'll do that in the fall semester and then the spring semester. And then the lessons and incentives are all provided uh, by Healthy Lifestars to the schools for free because of the generous donations that we've received. So I'll talk a little bit more about the different program components. So um, healthy, the curriculum itself has the three different healthy lifestyle habit or lifestyle habits, which Sophie mentioned, and they um, are composed into these lessons. So we have lessons and incentives to give to the kids, and we also use the activity as part of our curriculum. So I will briefly show you this is um, just a section of what a lesson looks like, but our lessons have five different components. So the first section is the focus and remind. So that really sets the lesson up for the day. And in that section, we um, are telling the students what we're gonna be talking about for the day, and we set a goal. And then from there, we move into the engage, hook, and activate section. And in this section is the body of the educational component. So this is just part of that section. Um, and this lesson was on being active. So this was the I am active introduction. And so we're asking the kids, what does it mean to be active? And we let the kids respond back to us. And then um, we can prompt them with different questions that we have, as well as we can do demonstrations. So you can see here um, that we demonstrate running in place or doing jumping jacks so that the kids can get their heart rate elevated and then we can have them put their hand to their chest so that they can actually feel their heart beating. So this is the main co teaching component of the lesson, but then we go into the review section. So the review section is actually tying the educational component back into their everyday life. So we're asking the students what they do to be active or um, what it feels like to them when they are outside playing recess, how their body feels if they get sweaty. So we really tie it back into their everyday life. And then from there, we move on to the I am active time. So this is where we want to have at least 30 minutes for the kids to be active, but if more time allows, then we'll um, be able to spend up to 60 minutes getting active with the kids, um, just so that they can actually experience that physical activity component of this program. And then finally, to end our lesson, we have a wrap up section. So here is where we review the key ideas of what we went over for the day, as well as we send the kids home with a healthy habit for them to practice for the next week. 
so from there, we have the um, 2019 evaluation recommendations. So we conducted an evaluation in the spring of last year, and this was the structure of our evaluation. So this program is um, tailored towards um, elementary age kids from five to 12. We just took a segment of this population, so our fourth through sixth graders, and we gave them pre and post um, test surveys to see what their knowledge was before they were exposed to the program and then after 12 lessons. We also um, had a fidelity survey for all of our coaches to complete um, after teaching each lesson so that we could see how the program was being implemented across all of our sites. And then we also conducted focus groups with the four groups listed here um, to kind of get ideas of how, it, how the program ran. So from this evaluation, we got back three broad recommendation categories, which include program, coaches, and students. So there are a lot of program recommendations listed here, but we're gonna briefly touch on the ones that are bolded and then show you what we've done um, to improve our program since then. So one of the recommendations that we received was to encourage more parent participation as well as to ensure that there was a good coach to student ratio um, for each site that we're at as well as developing supplemental materials um, to make sure that we're encouraging engagement and comprehension of the lessons, of the information from the lessons, and as well as to develop a standardized incentive program um, so that we can use across all of our sites to make sure that the program is being implemented to its vitality. Again, like Josie mentioned, we do have many coaching recommendations, but we are going to highlight and talk about the ones that are bolded. So some of our recommendations included providing additional training to the Healthy Life Stars coaches, opening up opportunities for them to shadow experienced coaching coaches if they are newer coaches, and then also planning the physical activity in advance to try to tie it to the lesson of the day. And then the student recommendations were um, a best practice is to not mix older and younger students. So when we are working with an entire elementary school, we want to be able to divide the kids up into older and younger grades. Um, so, so that way we can separate them based on the appropriate um, age level. And that's the, that goes along with the second recommendation of developing separate lessons so that the younger and older kids have the appropriate um, material. And so from here, we'll talk about the implemented changes that we've made since um, receiving these recommendations. So the first thing that we did was we developed kid worksheets. So um, there's two of them shown here on the left of the screen, and I know they're kind of hard to see um, since they're poor <laughs> size down, but they are supplemental worksheets that reinforce the lesson. So for example, this um, worksheet is on I eat right. So it was talking about proper nutrition choices and these really um, address the following recommendations. So this is a supplemental material that we can use that, re that reinforces what the kids are learning in the lesson. Um, and it also increases how interactive our lessons are. So these worksheets can be done during our lessons if time allows, or they can be taken home with the students to um, complete at home with their family. And we've also um, developed separate lesson or worksheets that go along with the lessons for age groups. So there's a level one and level two. And as you can see, level one is a little easier by just circling all of the healthy foods, whereas level two, you have to make a choice between which one is the healthier item. Another recommendation that we decided to implement were parent worksheets. When we first received the program, there was no component that encouraged parents to get involved with what their child was learning at Healthy Life Stars. And we really thought this would be beneficial to encourage and foster conversations between the parent and child about what they're learning and then possibly implement what they're learning um, as a family and implement some changes that would lead to a healthier lifestyle. So these worksheets talk about what the child learned in the lesson that day. They also provide an activity that the whole family can do together and they provide a healthy, affordable recipe that the family can cook together. And these recipes were created with WIC and SNAP benefits in mind. Uh, so this helps encourage parent participation in our program and is a great addition to what we have received. 
The next thing that we've done is we developed an online coach training. So when we, when we received this program in 2018, there um, was just a basic bare bone structure of how coaches should be trained. So from that, we were able to develop an online interactive coach training that to be completed by all of our coaches to ensure that everyone is being trained in a standardized way. Um, so this coach is, or this training is available online, which is really important as we begin to expand statewide so that all of our coaches are able to um, get the same training. And this really addresses um, the recommendations from our evaluation to provide those clear communications of expectations and practices for coaches as they go out into the community, as well as to make sure that our program is being implemented the same across all of our sites. And like I said, this is an additional training for our coaches to take, so it also um, satisfies that recommendation. We also developed an online nutrition module. So one of the recommendations we received was to provide additional training for our coaches. And we also heard back from some of our coaches that they didn't have the background in nutrition that they wish that they did when they're, um, and so when they're out um, in the different after school programs, if a student were to ask them a specific question about fruits and vegetables, for example, they didn't feel like they were adequately prepared to respond and answer those questions. So this really gives them the baseline knowledge that they need in order to be able to answer those questions student ha students have and really um, allow for all of our coaches to be able to have a baseline knowledge of nutrition. Additionally, we decided to implement something we're calling the coaching workshop. So while the new coaching training really improved the preparedness of our coaches, we still noticed that there were gaps in the level of experience or how, how well each coach excelled. Um, and we really wanted to address those key issues. So we noticed that in general, the coaches were not clear on the roles and responsibilities between the program coordinator, the coaches, and the site staff. So within the coaching workshop, we focused on addressing those roles, reiterating, reiterating what those were, and whose responsibility it was, especially when we're coming into an after-school program that has um, employees there that should also be participating in the program in some capacity. Additionally, we noticed that some of our coaches were not prepared with the format of our lessons. As we kind of saw in the example lesson, our lessons are formulated a lot on question and answer responses, and it's very easy for our coaches to just read the lesson as if it is a script instead of expanding the lesson and encouraging interaction and participating with students. So we decided to give an example and do a demonstration of how to expand a lesson. And then we also provided a workshopping time where our coaches had time to expand the lesson themselves, present it in front of us, and then we were able to give feedback on that lesson, which um, helped rec or address sorry, our recommendations of providing additional training and then also um, encouraging the coaches to plan the physical activity in advance around the lesson that they taught. Additionally, we did um, record this, so it is now offered online as well. Usually this is done between the fall and spring semester, so coaches have had at least a semester of coaching experience before they engage in this continuing education opportunity. But for those that can't be there or who are not directly in Iowa City, they can't access this online. <clears throat> Additionally, um, we have uh, implemented a standardized incentive program. So before, in 2018, when we just had received the um, programming, there was no real uh, specific method of how these incentives were supposed to be given. So we decided to implement a method where they have six attendance stars and those are given throughout the 12 week lesson progression. And now those stars correlate with two lessons and two worksheets. So for example, the pink star correlates with two lessons that correlate with two pink worksheets. And in order for a child to earn that star, they must complete the two pink worksheets. And we really wanted to implement this standardized incentive program because we were noticing that some kids, um, the, the competition between kids was starting to become more negative because children didn't have an opportunity to earn a star if they had missed 
a healthy life starts lesson. And then after school programs, that's gonna happen. Children have very little control of when they are picked up, if they have appointments after school, et cetera. So with this, a student can miss one lesson, but also make up the worksheet and then make up that star. So they have a reason to keep going for all five stars if they miss a lesson or two, or six stars, excuse me, if they miss a lesson or two. So we just highlighted a majority of the best practices that we've implemented, but um, there are still other recommendations that were listed and changes that we've made. But for the sake of time, we won't go through all of these. They will be posted in our presentation online um, for you all to view. So additionally, we do have lots of future plans. We do really want to, like Josie mentioned, expand um, statewide. So that is our ultimate goal. So how can you get involved? So really all we need to do is connect. So I, like I said, I'm the program coordinator for Healthy Life Stars. So first just meeting with me to understand how this program best fits in your community. And um, from there we go into signing a partnership agreement. So this is just to make sure that the program is implemented in its fidelity and so um, stating that we as Healthy Life Stars are gonna provide you with all of the lessons, incentives, training and technical assistance that you may need throughout um, the program. And then from there, we set an implementation plan. So when you um, will start the program, who will be implementing it, where it'll be implemented, and then any questions from there. So with that, we'll an answer any questions that you have. Like I said, I'm Josie. This is my contact information here as well as Sophie's. Awesome, thank you Josie and Sophie. We do have a couple questions in the chat if you're ready. Yeah. So um, the first was, did you include registered dietitians in the material development? So in the initial material development, the um, lessons, so we do have 36 um, lessons available that cover those three um, physical activity, nutrition, and goal setting. When those were originally developed, um, years ago, they were there was a dietitian included on um, that curriculum team. Great. The next question um, is from Kellen Anderson. Um, eating disorders and unhealthy body image is dramatically increasing among youth, even starting at age eight, and adolescents across the state. How does messaging within this program remain food and body positive without talking about restriction? Um, and just about finding joy in movement. So we really try to emphasize in our program about just choosing healthy choices. We never mention restriction at all. Um, we really focus on just making sure that we're getting those recommendations out there. So making sure that students are aware of how to physically move their body and um, what foods are nutritious, nutritious and healthy for them. We don't really put um, a connotation as this is a bad food, this is a good food, but more as this is a healthy option versus this is the not so healthy option and maybe we should eat it in moderation. Um, so we look more at like broad concepts rather than um, into the details of, um, I'm losing my train of thought what word I'm looking for, but we'd um, try not to focus on that um, negative energy of um, shaming for um, body image or body weight at all. And we've been yeah. looking at, um, we are looking at to develop more than our 36 lessons that we mm -hmm. currently have. And we are looking at those topics of addressing um, body image and eating disorders and those sorts mm -hmm. of topics. So we are definitely open to, um, getting suggestions for a new lesson. Yeah, like I was just gonna add just a little piece, but like Josie said, um, nowhere is it specified, you need to be this specific weight, have this specific body type. We truly try to, again, focus on broad concepts and um, address what behaviors can you implement. It's about behaviors, not about a specific size or a specific amount of activity or food. It's what are general behavior choices that I can make that will empower me to live a healthy lifestyle. Okay, two more questions here. Do you have data from your evaluation on the degree to which student behavior might have changed around the healthy lifestyles choices um, following their partic participation in the program? Sorry, I think you cut out for that first part of the question. I couldn't hear. 
Sorry, do you have data from your evaluation on how student behavior might have changed around their participation in the program? So in our evaluation report, um, we do have our evaluation just had the pre and post survey. And so we did ask um, students about their behaviors before and after. Um, there is some data that we, we did collect. Um, and for the most part, we didn't see a huge dramatic change in um, behavior, but we did see a change in increased knowledge. Um, so we are, it was a small sample size last spring, but we uh, plan to conduct, conduct a new evaluation this fall. We, we were conducting one this spring until um, COVID happened. So now we're no longer in the schools, but unfortunately, but hopefully this fall we'll be able to um, gather more information and data from our students to um, see if there is um, behavior change. All right, and I lied. There's actually two more questions in. <laughs> so the first one's easy. Um, are you able to get copies of the worksheets if somebody wants to see them? Um, so I can share a couple examples of the worksheet, but um, we do ask before we share our worksheets out there that um, we have an agreement signed between our partnership. So um, our, like I said, our program is completely free. It's um, just to make sure that you will use our materials to their fidelity and not um, share them with people that shouldn't have them. But we are working on um, making some of these worksheets and parent materials available right now without signing a partner agreement so that um, families can have these resources during this time. So we are currently in the process of making a web page that will be available to the public to see um, at least some of these resources that we have, which is really great. Great, and then last question as part of this presentation, um, can Healthy Life Stars be expanded to middle school and high school students? We would love if that could happen. Um, these lesson plans are really tailored towards elementary age students right now. Um, we are looking at um, using high school students as our volunteers to actually um, lead these coaching sessions with our elementary schools. Um, we've talked about it in some of our more rural communities um, that we're partnering with. They have a great volunteer base um, with their high school students. And so to be able to teach those younger students about these healthy habits would be awesome. Um, we would love if this program could ex be expanded to older students. We just don't have the curriculum for that right now. Awesome. Well, thank you, Josie and Sophie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you guys for listening yeah. to our presentation. <laughs> yep. Um, and I was going to say, if anybody has any questions for any of the speakers, we can kind of open it up right now to all three sessions. Um, and while we're waiting for people to type in, um, I just wanted to thank all the presenters um, for their time and all their efforts, um, especially during this time of coronavirus. Um, let's see. I don't think I'm seeing any more questions here. So um, I guess I just wanted to go ahead and close us out, but just say that we, like, thanks everybody and um, that we'll be having the same um, presentations tomorrow. So here, thank you, Lena. <laughs> she put up the next three presentations that'll be tomorrow um, at noon. So if you have any questions, go ahead and check out our website. But again, thank you to all the participants and presenters for your time. All right, everybody stay safe out there, okay? <laughs> thanks.